He is the action coordinator for San Francisco Atheists. He's also a board member of the CFI, and he's done tons of other things. But most importantly, he knows how to fence, and it's super awesome, because we did a photo shoot yesterday for next year's calendar. And he had this sword, and he was just like, it was amazing. I am in awe. It was awesome. All right, without further ado, David Fitzgerald. All right. Wow, there are a lot of you out here, aren't there? <laughs> Hello, Skepticon. <laughs> so here's the thing. 10 years ago, it never even crossed my mind that there might not be a historical Jesus. Because, I mean, let's face it. He's got to be the most famous person in all of human history, the most influential person. And even if he wasn't the divine son of God, you know, which none of us think that, at least, you know, there had to at least been a guy named Jesus, or even maybe a couple different guys in first century Judea who were Jesus. But at any rate, there's good evidence for it. We have lots of eyewitnesses for him. We have his very words. There's just good, solid, rational reasons to believe that there was a Jesus. Or so I used to think. Then one day, I got curious to see, you know, I wonder, what is the evidence for Jesus? And that's where this talk comes from. This talk is brought to you. <laughs> this talk is brought to you by the book Nailed. And if you really hate this talk, you're really, really going to hate the book. <laughs> now, since it's, I've got my watch, it's just past half 12 now. This. There's so many arguments to bring out in this issue that we're not going to get out of now. So this is just the quick and dirty version. And since we're going from this straight into lunch, it's going to be even quicker and dirtier. So bear with me, and let's just run with it. So to get started, first thing we have to do is find out, well, just what does history say about Jesus? Now, even though he's supposedly the most influential person in all of human history, as soon as you actually try to pin down history, the first thing you get from apologists is, oh, well, you know what the funny thing is? There's really no reason for contemporary historians of his time to have taken notice of Jesus. But is that right? It seems like there's a few biblical incidents that might have made history at the time. <laughs> first of all, we've got Caesar taxing the world. Now, Luke's gospel says that Jesus was born the year Caesar Augustus declared a tax on all the world. This creates all kinds of problems, not least of which because Matthew says that Jesus was born during King Herod's reign, which ended in 4 BC. And the only Roman census at that time was at 6 AD, which is a gap of 10 years. There have been many, many, many famous attempts to try to rectify this, and none have held up. We also have Herod's slaughter of all the baby boys in Bethlehem to try to get Jesus. We have Jesus' triumphant entry in Jerusalem. He entered in Jerusalem, and the entire town welcomes him as their king, and yet somehow the Romans don't seem to notice that either. <laughs> Jesus casting out the money changers. Now, as we all know, Jesus is said to come in and cast out all the greedy money changers from the temple. But as B Robert Price points out, the temple area covered 34, 35 acres, the equivalent of 34 football fields. So it would have contained thousands of pilgrims, innumerable livestock stalls, money-changing booths, and it was crawling with armed guards to prevent just this sort of thing in the first place. So we've got two possibilities. Either Jesus was this one-man kung fu army of death who did all this on his own, <laughs> which is possible, it is Jesus. Or some scholars have said perhaps what it was is that he led a small force of zealots to take over the temple and cast out all the money-changers. And that's certainly reasonable, except that's all the more reason that the Romans would have taken notice of it. And then, of course, we have the events surrounding Jesus' death. All kinds of weird supernatural shit comes down after Jesus is crucified. There's an earthquake. In fact, there's two earthquakes. There's a supernatural darkness that covers at least the whole region, if not the whole world, depending on which gospel you're asking and uh, for them. The sacred temple curtain in the Holy of Holies tears from top to bottom. And there's the resurrection of many holy people who appeared in Jerusalem, according to Matthew. Somehow... Mark, Luke, and John missed that, 
along with every other historian in history. And then, of course, after his death, a day or possibly eight days or possibly 40 days after that, depending on which gospel you ask, Jesus comes back, remains on earth, and then goes back up to heaven in front of many witnesses. And we'll come back to that later. So these are just a few of the more conspicuous incidents that we see in the gospel that we have no corroborating evidence for at all. But if you ask anybody, and even most atheists, they'll assure you, oh yeah, there's a whole battery of contemporary eyewitnesses who attest to Jesus. So let's bring these guys out. This dozen and a half or so are the ones who are most often cited as witnesses for Jesus. And we don't really have time to go into all of them, so I'm just going to spring ahead and go into the ones who are the most credible. Let's put them on the timeline. Here is our eyewitness timeline. Here's the first century. Now here's Jesus. Now if you look, the points on that are extremely pointy and well-defined. You've got 4 BC, 33 CE. But in fact, it should be a lot fuzzier because we don't really know when he was born. As it says, it could have been as early as 4 BC. It could have been as late as 6 AD. And we really don't know what year he died. In fact, it could have been 31 CE. It could have been 33 CE if Matthew, Mark, and Luke are right. Or it could not have been 33 AD or 31 AD if John is right, because he has them dying on a different day altogether than the other Gospels. Let's see where the rest of the witnesses pop in. Would you look at that? <laughs> As you can see, absolutely none of these guys are in any position to give any contemporary eyewitnesses of the time Jesus lived, not a single one of them. And to be honest with you, I wouldn't even hold that against them if their testimonies had anything relevant to say. But most of their testimonies are discussing Christians, and nobody disputes that there were Christians in the second century or the first century. And again, in the book, I, I go into what they actually do say. In fact, of all the eyewitnesses, the only one that could even be considered a near contemporary to Jesus is a Jewish historian, Flavius Josephus. And even he was born after Jesus' alleged death and wrote 60 years after that. We'll come back to him later. Now, this isn't to say that there weren't people who were there to notice and that no early survive, uh, accounts survive from the first century. Now, despite the, the fervent wishes of apologists, the first century is not this total black hole of history. It's one of the best historical documented periods that we know in history. And there are several historians and other writers who did live at the right time and the right place to see the beginnings of Christianity. And what's more, these writers had plenty of good reasons to be interested in it enough to say something about it. And there are plenty more Roman and Greek and Jewish writers who w did do all those things but didn't have reason there to write. But we have plenty that did. Here's a couple of those. Just touching on them real fast, Epictetus was a major Greek philosopher who espoused a brotherhood of man that was remarkably similar to Christ, but he makes no mention of Jesus or Christianity whatsoever, but that's okay. Marshall and Juvenal were observant social satirists. They, these two poked fun at all aspects of first century Roman society, but they have nothing to say about Christians. And again, maybe that's okay. Maybe Christianity was, just wasn't on the radar yet, or maybe they just didn't think Christianity was funny. Though, strangely enough, later Roman satirists, like Lucian, found Christianity very funny. <laughs> Lucius Martius Aeneas Seneca, Seneca the Elder, is widely regarded as the greatest Roman writer on ethics. So it's certainly odd that a writer on Roman ethics would have nothing to say about what's arguably the greatest ethical shakeup of his time, but that's exactly the case. Pliny the Elder was a scientist who wrote volumes not just on natural and astronomical phenomena, like, say, earthquakes and supernatural darkness, but also on legends and cultic beliefs. Now, here's a guy who would have been really interested in everything that happens around Jesus and Christianity, but he has nothing to say about either, and this should raise a huge red flag for us. And there's two others that aren't on this older slide, but they are in the book, and that's Seneca the Younger, who, like Pliny, also wrote about nature and, and strange phenomena, and he wrote a book called On Superstition, De Superstitio, which was lambasting all the major religions of his time, and yet nothing to say about Christianity. His brother, Gallio, is actually in the Bible. He's the judge in the book of Acts at Paul's uh, trial. He not only has nothing to say about Jesus, he has nothing to say about Paul either, which is very strange. <laughs> but those are all Romans. Let's see what we can get from the Jews. Whoop, too far. Justice of Tiberius is a Jewish historian. Now, Justice of Tiberius lived in the first century, 
He was a native of Galilee, lived just a few miles up the road from Jesus' hometown. To make the whole thing just perfect, he wrote a huge history covering the entire time when Jesus lived. And in fact, the only reason we even know about justice is because of what he had to say about Jesus. He doesn't have a goddamn thing to say about Jesus <laughs> at all. Which completely outraged the, the, uh, the uh, Byzantine church fathers in the ninth century. Because he's a Jew, so naturally he's not going to mention Jesus, is what they would say. Philo of Alexandria, a Jewish philosopher and writer who was alive before, during, and after the time of Christ, when Christ had his triumphant procession, when he drove the money changers out of the temple, when they had the birth earthquake, when he's crucified, all the holy people zombing through Jerusalem, he was alive for all that. In fact, we know he had strong ties to Jerusalem, and he was even in Jerusalem close to the time of these events. He may have been literally on site for these events. But he doesn't know about any of this, or seem to know anybody in Jerusalem who knows any of this. Now, mind you, he wrote entire books on other sects of his time, such as the Essenes and the Therapeutae, but nothing on Jesus, nothing on Christianity. And this is particularly weird when we realize it was Philo who developed so many ideas that influenced Christianity, such as the idea of the Logos, the Word, as in the Word uh, came flesh and dwelt among us, and in the beginning was the Word. There's also Nicholas of Damascus, who was Herod's personal friend, also his advisor, and his court historian. And there are many, many, many others. And also, there's not just these witnesses, but there's also suspicious gaps in writers that we do have records of. And there's completely lost critiques that are mentioned by early Christian writers, but lost critiques of Christianity that are completely gone, were never saved. So there's a whole wealth of, of writings that we have uh, missing and opportunities for them to write that we have un that to go unwritten. Now, some people claim that the Talmud writers knew about Jesus. So let's take a look at their Jesus. Actually, let's look at both of their Jesuses. One of these is Jesus ben Pandera, who was reportedly a miracle worker and the bastard of a Roman soldier named Pandera. He was said to have been stoned to death and then hung on a tree on the eve of Passover in Jerusalem, which sounds good until you realize this happened during the reign of Alexander Janaeus about 80 years before Jesus was supposed to have been born. The other, Jesus ben Stada, was an evil magician that it was also said to have been stoned and hanged on the eve of Passover. But this was at Lydda, 30 miles from Jerusalem, and this is in the second century, about 80 years after Jesus was supposed to have died. And there is a Jesus ben Nasri who is, is mentioned in later Talmuds in the Middle Ages, but it's clearly a satirical one, and it was clearly written around the 4th or 5th century. So it's plain that the rabbis in the early on had no knowledge of Jesus apart from what they read in the Gospels. So let's go back to a Jew who does have something to say about Jesus. This is the only person on the apologist list who could even be considered the close contemporary. This guy trying hard to look like Julius Caesar is Flavius Josephus. He was born Joseph ben Matanyahu in Jerusalem in 37 CE. He was a reluctant Jewish commander on the side of Jerusalem during their war with Rome in the late 60s and the 70s. But he later went on over to the Roman side, which by Irish standards makes him a filthy little traitor, but since he wrote all these great historians, we can cut him a little slack and spend some time with him. He spends many pages describing a variety of different miracle workers and messiahs in the first centuries, but does he talk about Jesus? Well, this time it looks like we do have somebody that says something about Jesus. In volume 18, chapter 3 of his book, The Antiquities of the Jews, Josephus describes all these various misfortunes that fell under the Jews under Pilate. At one point, he's pushing grave images of Caesar on them. Another, there's a massacre. There's another sad calamity here. They all get booted out of Rome there. All very, very gloomy stuff. But right in the middle of all these depressing little tales of woe, there's this. Now, there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as received the truth with pleasure. He drew over to him both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. He was the Christ. And when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men amongst us, had condemned him to the cross, those that loved him at the first did not forsake him, for he appeared to them alive again the third day, as the divine prophets had foretold these and ten thousand other wonderful things concerning him. And the tribe of Christians, so named from him, are not extinct at this day. Now, funny thing about this, this whole thing sticks out like a Britney Spears video in the middle of a funeral. <laughs> Let's just take a quick look at the highlights of these, and you tell me if you think this was written by a first century Orthodox Jewish historian or by a forgery, uh, Christian forgery later. 
Look what he says. He calls him the Christ. He says, the 10,000 wonderful things concerning him, and he appeared to them alive again. So it's hard to believe that an Orthodox Jew, let alone a historian, wrote any of these things. Calling a criminal that was condemned by his fellow Orthodox Jews, the Christ, a Greek word for the Messiah, and gushing over the oodles of wonderful things he did like a schoolgirl, and casually mentioned that, oh yes, he returned from the dead. Now, as an Orthodox Jew, of course, I don't believe he was the Messiah, but clearly, you know, he was. And the tribe of Christians so named from him is not extinct at this day. Well, of course, there was never a tribe of Christians, and it's doubtful if Josephus would have made such a mistake. But the term Christian wasn't even used until the second century, and Christianity didn't even get tribe-sized until well into the second century. It was just scattered in organized, unorganized communities at that time. And he says, as the divine prophets had foretold, but normally careful historian Josephus doesn't mention who these prophets are or what they said, which is very unlike him. Another subtle indication of forgery that's not apparently obvious is the mistaken use of the word Gentile. It just so happens that Josephus, who is writing for a Roman audience, never uses the word Gentile in any of his writings. For instance, throughout Antiquities of the Jews and the Jewish Wars, he'll refer to non-Jews as Greeks or Syrians, regardless of their actual uh, ethnicity. And incidentally, I had a Christian friend of mine who called me on this and said, uh, no, Dave, in my edition of, of Josephus, he always calls Gentiles. And I said, really? You're kidding me. What, what edition do you have? The uh, Penguin Wisdom edition? I said, that's the exact same edition I have. And you'll have to show me where that was. He never could, so... Josephus would have been extremely interested in Jesus casting out the money changers from the temple, but he makes no mention of that. That's just the kind of story he liked, because he spends pages and pages documenting the antics of other lesser loser messiahs and miracle workers in great detail. Not to call him a loser, but John the Baptist, Judas of Galilee, Theodos the Magician, a Jewish messiah called the Egyptian, all of whom he rebukes as deceivers and impostures, and he has nothing good to say about any of them. In fact, pointing out uppity Jewish would-be messiahs is kind of a special focus of his. But this lone little snippet is all he has to say about the guy who's the real deal. He spends longer time describing the tawdry little sex scandal in the next paragraph than he does in, in any of this describing who he thinks is the actual messiah. And in fact, the reason that Josephus didn't like any of these miracle-working messiahs is that he spent his whole career declaring that his patron, the Emperor Vespasian, was the actual messiah. And lastly, the very next paragraph after this suspicious little passage starts by saying, at this time there was another sad calamity. Sad calamity? We just saw how a commercial for Jesus. What sad calamity? <laughs> okay. Stopping beating the dead horse here, in light of all this, really no historian argues that it's not a forgery anymore. The only argument left anymore is how much of a forgery it is. And Christians try to insist that, well, it's only a half forgery, that Josephus really wrote something and some monk in the Middle Ages tried to fix it up. Well, if that's true, how come the next paragraph ends that way? But here's the real kicker. The passage itself doesn't even appear until the fourth century. Earlier Christian church fathers and apologists, like the church father Origen, like uh, Clement of Alexandria, were constantly using Josephus in their ammo against uh, pagan debates. They would have given their mothers for a nice ace in the hole like this, but they never do. But somehow in the fourth century, it starts getting quoted by this man, Eusebius, Bishop of Caesarea. Let's just take a second to get to know him because I'm convinced most people have never heard of him, and yet, he is responsible in a large part for the Christianity we have today. And I'm, I think Christianity owes a huge debt to this largely unsung, tireless, illustrious, lying son of a bitch. <laughs> the father of ecclesiastical history. Edward Gibbon, the author of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, said, Eusebius himself directly, indirectly confesses that he is related whatever may rebound to the glory and suppressed all that could tend to the disgrace of his religion. And Eusebius himself has a chapter entitled, It will be necessary sometimes to use falsehood as a remedy for the benefit of those who require such a mode of treatment. <laughs> and we have example after example of catching him in a lie or changing the facts to suit himself. He drastically rewrote his official church history at least five times that we know of to keep up with changing church politics. But how do we know that it was Eusebius who did the forgery? Well, one strong clue is that he inherited his library, and therefore his copy of Josephus, from Origen, who is one of those church fathers that not only knows nothing about the passage, but criticized Josephus for never mentioning Jesus. 
He made other contributions, and we'll skip over these real fast because I'm trying to make it quick and dirty today. Uh, but one important thing he did do was Constantine's vision of the cross. Now, how many of you have heard the story about Constantine seeing the sign of the cross in heaven and, and uh, that converted him? Well, the interesting thing that this life-changing event doesn't appear in any biographies that they wrote while he was alive. In that earlier biography, Eusebius tells a completely different story, complete opposite. He wins his battles because he is a lifelong Christian and totally pious. It's not until he dies that we get that, that wonderful story. And the funny thing about Eusebius is most of the examples of his lying comes from his best defenders, who are usually 19th century English clergymen trying to, uh, to restore his reputation. So just backing up a little bit, this blatant forgery in Josephus, and actually there's another reference in Josephus later on that's not a forgery, but is simply talking about another Jesus altogether, and later Christians thought it was talking about Jesus. To recap, this forgery means that if we look at the entire first century, we are left with a grand total of zero historical references for a hundred years. So what do we have? We have the Gospels. So everything we know about Gospels stems from these four books. Now, you guys already know this because atheists have already matched up as being the top uh, religion know knowers. So I'll skip through this. Old Testament, New Testament. The New Testament's made of the Gospels, which along with the book of Acts, purports to be the biographies of Jesus Christ and the accounts of the early church. There's four of them, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The epistles are the writings of Apostle Paul and other Christian missionaries. And the book of Revelations is the source of innumerable bad Christian sci-fi movies and books about the rapture. Now, I think I also don't have to tell you guys that there's some discrepancies in the Bible. I'm oh, sorry. <clears throat> Just a few. These are in the conflicting counts of Jesus' genealogy and his nativity. And now what else we have? And his childhood and his baptism. Now what we have when we talk about this genealogy and, and his childhood's baptism, his ministries and his apostles, and his miracles, his teachings, his personality, and a very cornucopia of other contradictions about who and what and where he did everything. <laughs> and we're not talking about simple divergences in eyewitness testimony or bad translations of it. We're not talking about, well, Matthew said he wore a blue toga and Luke said it was a red toga. We're saying more like Matthew said this happened in Egypt and Luke said it happened in Jerusalem and John said that never happened. And so let's look at some of these. And please keep in mind that there are many, many more discrepancies in just these accounts, but it would take an encyc entire encyclopedia to list them all, and there are several encyclopedias that list them all. Here we go. And by the way, I have Dan Barker to thank for all these. Is Dan Barker here yet, or is he here tomorrow? Um, these are all from his book, Godless. Who went to the tomb? Well, if we ask Matthew, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, James's mother, come to see the tomb. It's closed by the heavy stone. Mark says, Mary Magdalene, James' mother, and Salome, having already seen the tomb, come to anoint Jesus' body, wondering among themselves, who will roll away the stone? But luckily, they arrive to find the stone already rolled away. Luke says, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and other women, having already seen the tomb, come to anoint Jesus' body with no thought of how they're going to roll away the stone. John says that since Jesus' body had already been anointed slowly, shortly after his death, Mary comes alone and finds the stone rolled away. What does Mary find? Well, according to Mark, it was a young man sitting inside the tomb on the right. Luke says it was two men standing inside. John says it was two angels sitting on each end of the bed. And Matthew says a great earthquake occurred, and then an angel descended, blazing like lightning, paralyzed the Roman guards with terror, rolled away the stone, and sat on it. <laughs> And again, I feel compelled to point out once more that these aren't even all the discrepancies in the resurrection accounts. The Gospels are packed with contradictions like these from before Jesus' birth to after his death and everywhere in between. And you sometimes hear Christian scholars admit, well, yes, it's contradictory, but that's to be expected. No one sees the same thing, and these all are, were eyewitness accounts, blah, 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 blah. And my favorite of all time is, well, the contradictions show that it's true. So let's do this. Let's just say that's not bullshit, and for argument's sake, that we accept that all these people were real people, and that furthermore, that all the gospel writers really did interview them. 
who are these eyewitnesses that know so much when they're talking to one evangelist and know little when they're talking to another? I'll show you what I mean. Now, of course, in a court of law, this would all be thrown out in the first place for being mere hearsay, but let's say Mary herself is a real person and we have her on the witness stand. Sure. Maybe she's not going to remember what time of morning it was exactly or who was with her or what got said, but honestly, are we supposed to think that when she talked to Mark, he say, said, yeah, there was a guy and he was sitting on the other side of the tomb, and that's what I saw. And then when she talks to Matthew, says, oh yeah, then when there, there was a mighty earthquake, angel of the Lord came down, blazing like lightning, terror rolled the stone, terrorized the armed guards from sheer terror, now he risen from the dead, and of course, yeah, lots of other dead holy people came back to life from the tomb and started walking around Jerusalem. <laughs> really? Really? So how can these gospel accounts be so contradictory? Well, first of all, let's take a look at who these authors were alleged to be. First up, we've got Matthew, Matthew Levi, tax collector, one of Jesus' 12 apostles. We have Mark, John Mark, who is supposed to be the interpreter of the apostle Peter. We have Luke, said to be Paul's personal physician. He's also said to have written the book of Acts. And John, who's usually insisted to be the Apostle John, son of Zebedee, but the text only says it was the disciple who Jesus loved, and there's been a lot of guesswork to determine it was uh, John, but there's been other candidates as well, including Lazarus. Now, it's interesting to see that Luke made the cut at all, since his connection is through Paul, and Paul wasn't an eyewitness either. And apologists compensate this difficulty by declaring that Luke is an excellent historian. And what do they base it on? Well, Luke says right in the beginning of his book, he is an excellent historian. <laughs> well, all right then. <laughs> That's right. And I cannot tell you how many blog posts I've seen where the comments are, all caps, Luke is the best historian, he's excellent, careful historian. Except that he's not, that's the problem. <laughs> and there have been countless examples of, of why this is, including the fact that our excellent and careful historian friend has ripped off almost all his historical details from our old friend Flavius Josephus. And even then, not always accurately, which is how we know that he's stealing from Flavius Josephus and not the other way around. What's more, while it appears he's very familiar with Roman sites and taverns, which he casually rattles off without explanation, not only does he not know Aramaic, the language of first century Judea, he has very little knowledge of Judea itself, since he makes several mistakes that no Judean Jew would ever make. Now, I say Luke, but I suspect you already know that the four official Gospels were not written by anybody named Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, and even conservative scholars have accepted that. And we could even question if these guys were real, but that's a whole other can of worms. In fact, all the Gospels are anonymous, and titles like According to Matthew or According to Mark were not added until late in the second century. And in fact, no one seems to have even heard of our Gospels until well into the second century. One reference around the year 120 is from Papias, the Bishop of Hierapolis. He quotes from Matthew and Mark, but the only thing is his quotes don't match anything we have in our Matthew or Mark, so we don't know what he's quoting from or they were still under construction in the year 120. Just 10 years after Papias, Justin Martyr knows none of the four gospel authors. He calls them the memoirs of the apostles. So we have no way of knowing of who or how many people really wrote the gospels and only guesses as to where or when or how many times they've been edited or re-edited. In fact, it's only until the year 180, which is a full 150 years after the supposed death of Jesus, that we even learn what the four canonical Gospels are and discover why they're exactly four, no more, no less. Does anybody know why there's just four and no more, no less? God says so. God says so. That's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> he is dead right. It's because there's four quarters of the earth and four universal winds. Science, people. Science. <laughs> Another church father says, since the world sits upright upon four, is supported by four pillars, it's only natural that the gospel is supported by four pillars. Mark, the oldest gospel, alludes to the Jewish war with Rome and the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. So it was obvious that it was written after that. In fact, some people think it was written directly in response to that. And there are other reasons to think it was written after the destruction of Jerusalem. Matthew and Luke, for their part, they rework Mark. So we know that they came later still. And as I mentioned, our excellent historian friend Luke rips off Flavius Josephus quite a bit from a book that was written in 94 AD. So that is the earliest even humanly possible date 
for Luke. And it's probably much later because it doesn't get quoted until well into the second century. That's true of all the Gospels, by the way. It's also clear that the Gospels of Mark, Matthew and Luke could not possibly have been written by anyone remotely close to Jesus, and not just because they would have been long dead. For one thing, all the Gospels are written in Greek, not Aramaic. And, plus, both writers plagiarize largely word for word up to 90% of the Gospel of Mark and simply add their own twists on it, sayings of Jesus and supposed historical details. This is not some crazy atheist heretical notion. This has been the majority opinion of scholars, all biblical scholars, for almost 200 years. This is what they call the synoptic problem. And yeah, it's a problem. Let's ignore the fact that Matthew and Luke contradict each other in things like the genealogy of Jesus and his nativity story completely. And thus, both of them can't be right. One of them has to be wrong, at least. But let's ask this instead. Why would a supposed witness like Matthew have to plagiarize the writings of some guy who wasn't an eyewitness and just tweak his story a little bit. And weirder still, the guy he's stealing from, Mark, supposedly got his gospel from his good buddy, Peter. So why is it that the other gospels all have more anecdotes about Peter, including the example of Jesus saying to him, Peter, you are the rock upon which I shall build my church. I think Peter would have remembered that and told that to Mark. Actually, I think Peter would have said, Jesus, what's a church? Since churches hadn't been invented when he supposedly said that. <laughs> and it gets worse. First of all, <laughs> I'm getting ahead of myself. The author of Mark shows no understanding of the social situation in the Holy Land. He makes numerous errors that no Jew or anyone in living in Judea in the first century could ever have made. When you compare Matthew and Mark's gospel, you'll find that the author or authors of Matthew are constantly correcting his blunders about all aspects of Jewish society, the religion, the calendar, holidays, customs, attitudes, and yes, even Jesus repeatedly misquoting scripture. But one last nail in this coffin is that whoever wrote the gospel of Mark shows a George Bush-like lack of familiarity with Palestinian geography. <laughs> no one who actually lived in Palestine could have made the mistakes that the author of Mark did. For instance, Mark 31 says, Then Jesus returned from the region of Tyre and went by way of Sidon towards the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. So let's look on the map. So the route from Tyre went down the coast to the port city of Akko and then down south to the Sea of Galilee to the Decapolis region, south and east. So where is Sidon on the map? Oh, there it is. It's 22 miles to the north and 50 miles out of his way that he'd be walking on foot to get there. So to use a, 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 a Missouri metaphor, this is like going from St. Paul to, uh, sorry, St. Louis to Springfield by way of Milwaukee. And this is one of several blunders that uh, Mark makes and geograph geographical blunders. In fact, the mistakes in Mark are so blatant that a church father, Origen, gave up completely on trying to make sense of his geography and said, it has to be interpreted symbolically and mystically. <laughs> so these are the three so-called synoptic gospels, which is Greek for seen together. I don't know what the Greek word for ripped off from one another is. Do you know? It's all right. Okay. Now, but unlike these three clones, the Gospel of John is very, very different. In fact, it was rejected early on as being a heretical gospel by some Christian groups and church fathers, but it proved to be so popular that it couldn't be repressed, despite the fact that it has virtually nothing in common with the teachings or the theology or the style or even the content of the other gospels. As I said earlier, he even has Jesus being crucified on a completely different day. And G John's Jesus has a completely different personality much more badass and in charge. In the synoptics, Jesus is a secret messiah. He never gives his secret identity. He teaches his disciples mostly in private. He's constantly hiding his miracles. He's telling lepers, now, don't tell anyone where I touched you. It'll just be our little secret. <laughs> I know, so bad, so bad. But not John's Jesus, oh no, baby. John's Jesus knows he's God, and he doesn't care who knows it, but he'll tell you. In fact, that's about all he talks about. He might as well have a big t-shirt saying, I am God, written over, because that is what he strode through Jerusalem saying all the damn time. Now, in the synoptics, 
Jesus drives out the money changers at the very end of his career, gets in hot water, and gets crucified for it. John's Jesus? No, babies. He kicks off his career three years before that by going into there and smashing some heads. This badass mofo Jesus hardly ever seems to feel any doubt at all. He doesn't cry like some little sissy boy in the Garden of Gethsemane. He doesn't tell any fruity parables. There's no Sermon on the Mount, no Blessed are the Meek, no Love Thy Neighbor. There is certainly no liberal turn the other cheek crap. No, sir, there is none of that in John. This is a Republican Jesus. He does, however, call the Jews the spawn of the devil, which is a little odd seeing as he's one. In fact, John spends his entire gospel bagging on not the scribes and the Pharisees, but the Jews as, they were the, as if they were this big amorphous blob of evil, which is odd because our anti-Semitic gospel writer John is also supposed to be a Jew. But in one place, John's Jesus says something uncharacteristically humble. He says, the Father is greater than I. And that's just one place of several in the Gospels that contradict the idea of the Trinity. And in fact, the idea of the Trinity appears nowhere in the Bible at all. And isn't it a little weird, anyway, that the Old Testament God would never once even mention the fact that he's actually this three-in-one super God of the Father, the Son, and some bird-like spirit creature of some sort. And in fact, if you went to Moses and said anything remotely like that, what would happen? You would have gotten stoned to, Jeff and stoned to death in about two minutes flat. But as different, different as all this is from the synoptics, once we get to the passion narrative, yes, John starts cribbing from Mark 2. Now, he tweets the story to put his own spin on it, but it's very clear he's working off another copy of Mark. And sadly, there's even evidence that the unique parts of John are plagiarized from still earlier writings, such as the Greek, uh, the <coughs> Greek philosopher Pythagoras. There's also some obvious giveaways that, it, just like the other Gospels, it's been edited and added to. Here's one. Oh, there's the Trinity. Hello, Trinity. In chapter 2, Jesus performs his first miracle. Then down in verse 23, he performs some more miracles. And then after that, in chapter 4, he does his second miracle. So it's clear that somebody's been padding the books. And I should mention that these are just the four official Gospels that made it the cut. And there are many, many other Gospels that did not get enough support to get into the Bible. Does anyone want to guess how many Gospels there were? 13, 27, a couple hundred. Aren't we up to like 65 or so? It's in the 40s at least, yeah. Um, one Christian website said that there was over 4,000, uh, or some said there were 270, and they're all voted on at the Council of Nicaea. And that's just not true. The fact is it was far, far messier than that. There never actually was a one-time vote taken on which is gospel and which is scripture. It was a much more haphazard practice process that took over centuries. Um, mm, 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 mm. There are over 29 scrolls found in early catches like the Nag Hammadi uh, library, and many more that are listed in the writings of early historians that we've never found. And these are probably just a few of many. Who knows how many gospels there were that are, have just been totally lost to time. Mark was just the first gospel written. If everybody had been happy with it, we wouldn't have four gospels in our Bible. Matthew wasn't setting out to write some new gospel of his own. He was just improving on the only gospel he knew and adding to it and cleaning up its mistakes. Luke wrote, on the other hand, when there were tons and scads of gospels floating around, and he tries to make it sound like his is the only one on the market that's the real deal, even including Matthew and Mark's, who he steals from. John came along even later still, and he doesn't even pretend to try to be going along with the details of anybody else's gospel. So that's the state of our four biblical gospels, four out of many, many more contradictory, reworked writings set down decades after the supposed events by anonymous author or authors who were later falsely represented as eyewitnesses. But the gospels are only half our source of information about Jesus. We also have the letters of the Apostle Paul and the epistles. Or do we? So what about Paul and the other New Testament writers? Well, who was Paul, first of all? According to the official story, after Jesus' crucifixion, Paul became the greatest Christian missionary. He traveled throughout the ancient world, setting up churches, and wrote several letters. Though 
many, if not the majority of biblical scholars now say that he only wrote seven of the 13 letters attributed to him. Who was Paul's Christ? Let's take a gander at how he describes his Christ. Christ Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, the brightness of God's glory and the express image of God. He upholds all things by the word of his power. In him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. He's the mediator of the new covenant, the great shepherd of the sheep, the great high priest who's passed through the heavens. He's disarmed and subjugated the supernatural principalities and powers, the angels and authorities. He's the Lord of both the living and the dead. He descended into the lower pits of the earth, into the round of the dead, preached to the spirits in prison there and brought the souls of the captives out. He led captivity captive. He ascended on high, far above all the heavens. He gave gifts to mankind. He will deliver his followers from the wrath to come. He's a righteous advocate with the Father. He's able to subdue all things to himself. All things in heaven and earth were created by him, through him, and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. Now that is an awesome, awesome resume. <laughs> but do you notice anything missing in that? There's nothing when Christian writers in Paul's generation speak of their Christ Jesus, that sounds like they're describing a guy who lived on earth in Galilee just a few years before. They sound instead like they're describing a mythological figure. In the book of Acts, when people come on the scene and start preaching about Jesus, they go straight to the man Jesus, talk about all the wonderful things he did, and then they go into the fantastic, wonderful things he did in heaven. In the first generations, this is exactly the opposite. We get all mythological Jesus and almost nothing that can be tied to a here and now. In fact, nothing at all. He only never talks about Jesus' death, the Lord's Supper, or any events of Christ's life as though they actually happened to a real live person. So how is it that Paul and other apostles like himself know Christ? Is it through what Jesus did in his lifetime? Did the other apostles tell him? No, Paul vehemently denies this again and again that he's received his knowledge from any man. He says he has learned about the Son through revelation and scripture. God chose to reveal his Son through me, he says in Galatians 1.16. The writer of Ephesians says the mystery of Christ, which in former generations was not revealed to men, is now, now, disclosed to dedicated apostles and prophets speaking through the Spirit. Paul always points to Scripture as the source of his gospel. Everything he says that Jesus did is always according to the Scripture. Jesus did this according to the Scripture, blah, blah, blah. It's God through the Spirit who supplied this gospel. God who's appointed apostles like Paul to carry the message. It's important to recognize that Paul had been dead for decades before the gospels were even written. Paul and the other epistles came first, the gospel and Acts came much later. The only scriptures they knew were the Jewish scriptures. To Paul, the existence of the Savior up to this point has been unknown. He's been a secret, a mystery hidden away in heaven for eons by God. But now he's revealed along with the promise of salvation. This is what Paul and every other epistle writer is constantly telling us. They don't refer back to any sort of human Jesus, and indeed, in many places, there's no room for such a figure in their theology. They treat the Spirit of God and the Son of God as though it's exactly the same thing. Did Paul even know there was supposed to be a real guy named Jesus? If you look for any biographical info on the late Jesus of Nazareth, from Paul or from any non-gospel writer in the entire first century, you are out of luck because no one has anything to say about Jesus the human being. The words Bethlehem, Nazareth, Galilee never appear in the New Testament letters. The word Jerusalem is never used in connection with Jesus. There's not a hint of any sacred sites, let alone pilgrimages, holy relics, the clothes, the things he used in his daily life, the things he touched. There's absolutely nothing of that until the fourth century when pieces of the true cross start showing up and Jesus' tomb is discovered, both of them. And the first shrine on the supposed mount of Jesus' death is set up and the pilgrim business gets kicked off. So why the absence? The standard rationalization you get from Christian apologists is that Paul was uninterested in the earthly life of Jesus, which is truly one of the lamest rationalizations to ever come out of Christianity. It's not the very lamest, but it's right up there. Acts says that after his conversion, Paul went immediately to the elders in Jerusalem and reported for duty. But according to Paul's own account in his letters, he waited three years following his conversion before making a short visit to Jerusalem for 15 days to get to know Peter and James. And incidentally, he never tells us he was waylaid on the road to Jerusalem by a divine Jesus. Nothing like that ever occurs in his letters. 
And once he went to Jerusalem, he didn't make it back there for another 14 years. So did Paul learn all the facts of Jesus' life on that one occasion? And if so, what was he doing for those three years before he went to Jerusalem? And if he visited any of these things, can I think he would have not at least shared his experiences at some point? At least at some point in his letters? It's often they try to claim that the, example for, the explanation for Paul's glaring silence about Jesus' life is simply that Paul, and I guess everybody else in the first 50 years or so of Christianity, just never had occasion for mentioning things like all this mention, missing info about Jesus in their letters. But of course, they constantly have occasion, and they miss it over and over and over again. The New Testament writers never cite Jesus' teachings or examples in all these squabbles in the early church that was tearing apart early Christians. Issues like circumcision, salvation, is it by grace or is it by works? Can we take supper with unbelievers? Jesus ruled on all these things, but instead they keep going back to the old Jewish scriptures. Here's one example. Jesus teaches that all foods are clean, and yet they are still arguing about it with Paul and the uh, Jerusalem leaders. And in fact, it's so bad that the writer of Acts has to fake a vision that Peter has to explain why it's okay for them to eat all foods. But if Jesus had already pronounced on the question, why are they jumping through all these acrobatic hoops to do it? If everyone remembered it, why was there any dispute at all? Why is it that sometimes Paul disagrees with Jesus? All these guys only had to quote Jesus' own teachings, and that would have settled the case. Issue over. So why doesn't he ever, ever... Wouldn't you think that when Paul sets off on his missionary journeys, people will be asking questions about this guy from Palestine who was the son of God and the savior of the entire world? If not questions about his life, at least things that they, he taught. But instead, there's a total absence of these things. There's a gaping hole of silence that lasts for over a century. And this silence alone is one of the strongest arguments that the entire gospel account of Jesus' life is nothing but a work of inspired fiction. Now, here's another weird thing we find. Early Christianity, if it was started by a single person or a group of followers, it's a wildly, wildly schizophrenic movement. We know of at least a dozen early rival Christian movements scattered throughout the empire, including two main ones, two rival Christianities, Peter's Jewish-leaning community in Jerusalem that valued Mosaic law and works, and Paul's Gentile-based ministry that stressed faith overall and broke with the Jewish law. And there were many others as well that often had little in common with each other, and often he had different scriptures. And one other early rival of Christianity was John the Baptist's cult, by the way. Yet another early branch of Christianity was the Gnostics. Now, the name Gnostics is a blanket term for a wide range of different diverse groups, and scholars have tried long and hard to come up with one simple explanation that explains who they were and what their relationship was to each other and to the, relation, the religion that became Orthodox Christianity. But the term Gnostic is proving to be about as useful as the term mammal for trying to pin these guys down because their uh, dogmas were completely and constantly mutating by whim. One feature that most of them shared in common was that the creation of the world was a huge mistake and that pieces of God were trapped in bits of matter called human beings and that by acquiring secret knowledge and practicing them, their rituals, Gnostics hoped to learn how to rejoin with God in heaven. Bible scholars for the longest time just assumed that Gnostics were some later mutant form of Christianity. But over the years, after this finding things like the Nag Hammadi uh, cache, it's become very clear that this is not the case. And several Gnostic groups predate Christianity, and in the major portions of the empire, Christianity meant Gnostic groups who were in place decades and sometimes even centuries before Orthodox sects arrived. In these many, many diverse forms of Gnosticism, there are many, many diverse forms of Jesus. Sometimes he was a mythical part of the heavenly Pleroma, the Godhead. Um, sometimes he was something like John's mouthy Jesus. Sometimes he had strange titles like Dirdikius or the third illuminator. And some Gnostic Jesuses had an identical twin. Some Jesuses had sex. One Jesus might have had sex with a male apostle. Some Gnostics held that Jesus was totally divine and only appeared to die. Others held that he was simply a mere human man, and many other Gnostic groups were violently opposed to the idea that he could have appeared in the flesh at all. Now, it's impossible to know how many other forms of Jesus there were because, as I said, there were dozens of Gospels alone, let alone Gnostic groups, let alone other groups that we think of more as Christianity. 
Christians don't really know what to do with things like the Gnostics because they're so different and they're so bizarre from what we're thinking of as Christianity. But when we're talking about the early church, we're talking about these weird beard fleeting cultlets in first century Judea like the Gnostics. This was Christianity, even though we'd never recognize them today and they would have been gladly burned at the stake you know, hundreds of years later. Paul, in his letter, constantly harps on all the divergent groups and other apostles that preach another Jesus, one that's so different from his own that he lays curses on them and accuses them of being agents of Satan. It's a big problem. There's lots and lots of false Christs floating around in those days. So what's going on here? How could there possibly be all these so many different and competing Jesus movements? Was it like this? Did Christianity immediately branch off into these wildly diverse sects in some kind of Cambrian explosion? Well, here's how most scholars try to explain the situation. They say that different communities latched on to different fragments of Jesus, aspects of teachings or things they remembered about him, preserving certain traditions and forgetting everything else. So does that make any sense at all? We've got this explosion of wildly differing groups occurring pretty much right after Jesus' death, certainly by 20 years after his death. What happened to all those people who actually were related to Jesus and remembered Jesus and walked around with him? What happened to, how could they all disagree so violently about even the most basic facts of his life, like did he exist at all? <laughs> well, let's consider another possibility. Maybe it didn't happen like this. Maybe it happened like this. Perhaps all these diverse religious movements were already in place. And in the mid to late first century, their Christs and Lords became coalesced into the figure of Jesus Christ. Was that possible? Well, let's take a look. But before we do that, I want to ask you something. If you had to pick one person most responsible for giving us Christianity, who would you say? Paul? Paul? Anybody else? Eusebius? Constantine? I heard that. These are all good guesses. But I'm going to vote for this guy. That's right. It's Alexander the Great, a Greek bisexual imperialist pagan (laughs) who lived 300 years before. I'm getting the the, the hook sign, so we're going to have to wrap this up extremely fast. But here's the, in in a nutshell, in the Greek Hellenistic world, all these savior gods and goddesses from all these different parts of the empire, from Greeks to Persians and even Jewish influences, became coalesced into savior gods. By the first century, that was the sexy idea in religions. All the old, uh, the old pantheons were tired, and the new idea was the mystery face, these new savior gods, personal saviors. <laughs> how, much, how much time do we have, JT? Ten minutes over, damn, so much, so much. All right, let's cut right to the chase then, right to the chase. What is Jesus made of? (laughs) Jesus was made of Midrash. He was an allegorical figure created by the author of the Gospel of Mark to serve an allegorical picture purpose, just like many other savior gods at the time did. Um, And he fully expected his audience to know this, uh, the educated members of his audience to know this. Christianity did not start out as some with a single man or a single God, it started out in a thousand places all over the world, uh, over hundreds of years out of this rich melting pot, and created this ever-growing variety of forms and doctrines. It, all in all, you could not picture a better example of Darwinian evolution in action. And it is far from over yet, so who knows what Jesus the future has in store for us. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Thank you. Because we don't have time for questions, um, I just got one for you. Will you come back next year? I would love to come back next year. Excellent. I'd love to come back next year. All right, we're going to take kind of a shorter lunch break. If everyone could be back here at 1.45, that's when we'll start again. So... The book is out front. Buy it. Yes, buy his book. (laughs) If you missed the end of the talk, you can find it in the book.